It's 4.20 a.m. Hi, and welcome to the Stoned Witches Hour with Shell and Layla. All right, so welcome to episode eight. This is our Aliens and Gettysburg Ghosts episode. I'm Layla, representing the western half of the U.S., and today I'll be talking about Area 51 and the Roswell incident. And I'm Shell, and I'm going to be representing the East Coast today, and I'm going to be talking about Gettysburg. Although I am just dying to hear about the aliens. Oh, everybody is. Aliens are so fun. As soon as I started researching this, the mountains and mountains, and and I'm not talking like mashed potato mountains. I'm just talking about mountains and mountains of evidence coming in is insane. I love hearing all the firsthand accounts and everything. I had to focus. Otherwise I was getting overwhelmed with the stories and I love them. So I can't wait to dig into those in another episode. It'll be great. And, and I can't wait to uh, talk about Gettysburg again, overload of information, overload of ghosts and paranormal activity. Today is like a chock full of paranormal activity show. Grab your pipe, grab your bong and let's get spooky. Yeah, let's get spooky. This is a place I've been. This is a place I've had personal experiences at. It has been a whirlwind of a week, as I'm sure you can imagine, but I'm getting by with a smile. Good. It's almost 60 degrees here today. Holy cow. And you're in Massachusetts. It's never that warm there this time of year. (laughs) Do you want to know what the temperature was here in gorgeous Southern California today? Yeah, I'm probably fucking 85. Oh, no, go higher. (laughs) Higher? Higher. It's going to be 91 today. It's February. 91 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 33 degrees Celsius for our listeners outside the USA. (laughs) Really should not be anywhere close to this. We've been in the high 80s all week and today it's going to break 90. Remember like that February, maybe eight years ago, where it never got above negative 10 for the whole month? It was so cold. They were closing schools because of how cold it was. And now it's like 60 degrees on random February. It is just absolutely ridiculous. I, that is a whole nother podcast. I don't want to get into, you know, (laughs) climate change, capitalism, corporations, waste. Yeah. Let's not go there. Right. We're going to stay away from the downfall of civilization and go with fun things like murder and ghosts and (laughs) creepy stuff, paranormal happenings. Yeah. Really pick me up, make you happy things. Like this marijuana, which makes me very, very happy. (laughs) As it should. As it should. So what are you smoking today, Shell? This stuff, you know, I, I like to try new things. And sometimes I'm a name chaser. I'm not going to lie. If the name is catchy and the name sounds good, it draws me in. I know it's dumb. No, I'm with you. It's like the, it's like the, the book jacket, you know, when you see a really great title and a great cover art, right. you're, you're into it. Same thing with pot. Right. Yeah. And this, this is now tell me this doesn't sound delightful. Straw Nana. That sounds like a summer salad. It smells like a summer salad. Really? You know, I, I really get that strawberry banana hint out of it. And I, I was kind of surprised. I thought, well, you know, they named this stuff and it, never matches the name in the end. That is one of your pet peeves. That's true. But this does. Very good. Very delightful. I love that for you. You know, I know you're always searching for something that kind of tastes as good as it sounds. But that smoke is, is it tastes delicious, like fruity weed. I do like a good tasting weed. I really do. I'm smoking Skywalker. I went with like a themed kind of weed since I'm talking about aliens. (laughs) (laughs) So I went with Skywalker, which is one of my favorite, favorite smokes. I do love the taste. You know, I love a good citrus, I like a nice citrus taste. And this has got like that peppery spice, you know, kind of along a little citrusy peppery. I love it. It's good stuff. Also love the fact that it's kind of an indica as someone who struggles with bouncing from thing to thing when, you know, ADHD kind of rules my world. Uh, this is kind of a nice indica to keep me a little focused, a little more you know, kind of on one track so I can get things done rather than making me sleepy. It makes me a lot more focused. So I do like it for that too. The straw Nana is an indica as well, but this cute, cute little tin, 
I like how it has like the banana peel being peeled open with a strawberry coming out of the banana <laughs> peel. The power of advertising. I, I just wish I could like convey the smell to you. Like it's so good. I love that. All right. So let me get this stupid box open. I spilled my pot the other day. I was oh, so sad. Oh, Lord. What, what, what happened? It was awful. I remember I told you about that Keef box I have, my lovely yep. little Keef box. Well, it's held, the top is held on by magnets. That already sounds like a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> we've had this for years and never had this problem. This is the first time. So we've basically just been kind of like breaking up buds in here and just anything, you know, everything that kind of becomes shake or crumble, we've just been leaving it. And as that pile of kind of crumbly shake at the bottom has been growing, I've been getting all excited. I'm like, I'm going to roll so many fat fucking joints. That's going to be so good. And yeah. So I've been carefully cultivating this pile of multiple different types of wheat. That's going to just be amazing. Anyway. So I pick up the box and I go to move it and I misjudged the height of the desk next to me. And I guess I was just holding the top. So when I hit the box, it separated the magnets separated oh, and shake on a carpet. There's nothing to do, but vacuum that up. So yeah. My heart breaks for you. Thank you. Thank you. Like it actually breaks for you. Like that's like, you can't clean that up. No, no, there's nothing to be done. Can we have like a moment of silence? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) It was very sad, very sad moment. So one of my local retail establishments had a promotion going uh, recently that I took advantage of. Cause you know me, I'm curious, love to try stuff. Love promotions. Love promotions. You show me something that is eye-pleasing and I'm going to try to see if it is Mm smoke-pleasing. Imagine this. This is a pre-roll, okay? Okay. So basically like a one gram joint. Mm -hmm. And it is wrapped in rose petal paper. Oh my goodness. I've heard of those. Really? And the gram of weed is doused in butter, the cannabis butter. Really? So it's (laughs) can of butter? (laughs) Like can of butter, <laughs> can of, some can not of butter like, not like not like pressed hash oil or something, but like actual like edible butter. I guess that's what it said. It oh, said that weird. it had butter on it. I don't know. Was it butter with D's or T's? I smoked it before I read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. So can of butter. All right. Wow, is all I got to say about that. It was a, it was a, one of those Valentine's, oh, let's all be in love and smoke rose petal joints. I love rose petal joints. So I go in, the guy's telling me about it and I'm like, you know, so how is it? And he's like, this is definitely probably not a good Valentine's day appropriate thing to smoke. Why? And I said, why? And he goes, Because when you start smoking this, he's like, you will not be able to do anything. And you're like, that's exactly the joint for me. Give me five. (laughs) I'm like, so this is like a melt into the couch. He's he and he goes, this is like a make no plans. Nice. So, of course, I'm like, well, could I have two, please? (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) But, you know, aside from the ground flower being all wrapped up in the buttery goodness, like the rose petal paper was delightful because, you know, you're getting that, that good weedy taste, but then every so often you're getting that little flit of like rose taste. You know what I mean? It was very, it was very wonderful. I liked it. And I actually almost wish that they would sell them on the regular. Oh, I'm going to have to see if I can find any of those out here because that sounds really, really nice. There was a company that sold vape cartridges and I'm going to look it up and insert it later here because they were a great company, but they had a limited edition rose water flavor. And this, I knew definitely they were, you know, obviously adding terpenes for flavor, but it was such a delicate rose taste. I loved smoking that pen. I loved it so much. The high was fabulous that, you know, the, the pot oils were fantastic but just the rose smell and taste that went along with it. Beautiful. Top notch. Beautiful. Yes. It's, it's one of those things. I guess it was like that um, Ratatouille. It was like that Ratatouille movie <laughs> moment where, you know, the two things blend magically together and there's like a symphony. <laughs> Roses and pot just go together fabulously. It worked. It worked so well. And, and it was definitely, that was in 
he, the guy was right. Definitely a make no plans kind of pre-roll. <laughs> Good stuff. Oh, I like that. Granted that that butter really kind of took it up a notch. Delightful. Either way. Good stuff. It was delightful. Who was it that first came up with that rose joint? We should like. Boy, that's like a history thing. I don't know. So it was one of your local dispensaries that you got it at? Yes. Yes. Very nice. All right. So anything else, any other fun, interesting things going on before we get into our stories this week? I don't think so. Other than the fact that it's so warm, I can't even believe it. I know. I know. I don't love it. I I love my Februarys out here. The temperatures are usually way cooler. You know, it's it's a little hot right now. Well, it's hot where you are. That's true. You're in the land (laughs) of hotness. You're in the land of hotness. Yeah. Hot people, (laughs) hot places. My goodness. Who do we have? Let's see. Who's out here that's hot right now? I don't know. There's a whole bunch of stars that are having babies and shit. Everybody seems to have them in L.A. Yeah, uh, a, a lot of there are a lot of babies happening in Hollywood. I'm just happy about Rihanna. Congratulations, Rihanna and ASAP Rocky. I'm very, very happy. Which, by the way, wait. Rihanna looks so beautiful, pregnant. Just saying, stunning, fucking stunning. Now, there's only one person who looks more beautiful, pregnant than Rihanna, and that is my daughter. Congratulations! I'm so happy. My daughter. She is the most beautiful pregnant person, but Rihanna, close second. Now, does she have a nickname for the, you know, people say like Baby Bean or they say like ours was the little alien. <laughs> I mean, like, do people <laughs> have, it literally was, oh my God, and I'm talking about aliens today, but no, we literally would joke that she was like the creature from the movie Alien. Well, we, um, we as a mother and daughter are taking advantage of technology and are using apps. There was no baby pregnancy (laughs) tracking apps when I had kids. No, there was the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. And that was about it. (laughs) No, I was on a lot of boards. I I was pregnant later than you. So I was on a lot of like uh, message boards and stuff. But she has apps. So what kind of apps? We, We utilize these apps. The main one is Baby Central. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but Baby Central, good app. And every week, they equate the size your baby has grown to a fruit or vegetable. Well, that's fun. Makes it easy to kind of visualize. We kind of, each week, the nickname changes to coincide with whatever fruit or vegetable we're at. That's adorable. This week, it's little baby mango. Oh, got a little I baby love mango mangoes. Hi, baby mango. So we got ourselves a little one pound mango this week. And because we are hitting uh, the weekend and the change of the week, just so you know, we are moving into an ear of corn next week. So next week we will have a little baby boy ear of corn. Oh, little baby boy corn, little tassel, oh, little sweet corn. We kind of, we kind of keep the nickname changes based on the fruit or vegetable of the week. So it's the little baby veggie. It's a little veggie baby. He'll be a mango until tomorrow. And then tomorrow he will transform like a butterfly from a mango to an ear of sweet corn. Now his, his due date is that stayed the same. I know that was changing for a little while. It has. Um, we're looking at the first week of June. Super nope, excited. No, no, 15th, June 15th. She goes natural June 15th. Okay. Psychic Layla. The doctor, <laughs> the doctor says June 7th, but the you'll probably- wrong. You'll be right. (laughs) My daughter will be mad because I think she's expecting to not go after. She said that mid-May would work for her. Yeah. (laughs) Again, whole other podcast. Whole other podcast. (laughs) All I'm going to say is doulas are the most fabulous thing in the entire world. And every single pregnant person should have one. Anytime you give birth, there should be a doula there. There should be a postpartum doula. Everyone should have a doula. Doulas are like the God's gift to humanity and they should be everywhere. Rant over. I I went the midwife route. Well, a doula is like in addition to your midwife or in addition to your doctor. They're just like a a coach for the pregnant person. So you're giving birth and you have your midwife, you have your doctor, midwife, and then you got your doula who's like a badass, kick ass. I'm here for you. That's it. (laughs) And I love them. Everyone needs one. Because you know- 
Men are not good at that part. They think they're going to be, they want to be, but all you want to do is murder them in that moment because they're the ones who are causing you all this. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And they should be there to be able to focus on. I love you. I'm sorry. I'll never do this to you again. Everything's wonderful. (laughs) I'm buying you a Tesla. Everything's great. (laughs) You know, that's all that they should have to do. And Meanwhile, the doula is there to advocate for you, to make sure you're comfortable, to make sure that, you know, the midwife knows what's going on. You know, everyone needs a doula. To give the baby daddy a kidney shot in the back so that you feel like at least they're in pain too now. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's what a doula is for. And I honestly, again, whole other podcast, but yeah. Wow. We're doing whole other podcast talks today. It's the aliens. It's because they don't want us to talk about the aliens. It's the government conspiracy. It is. It really is. But speaking of midwives, I'm going to try to rope us back in here. Okay. Okay. A couple hundred years ago, over a hundred years, I shouldn't say a couple hundred years ago. Jesus, I don't, what am I talking How about? How old are we now, Shell? I know, right? <laughs> I, after this week, I feel a couple hundred years old. What are we talking here? Like 1863. So I don't know. I'm bad at math when I'm high. So I don't know. 130 years ago. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, yes, yes. I imagine that their birthing practices weren't top notch then either. You know, and they were not. (laughs) Imagine giving birth to a child in the middle of a civil war. I thought my birthing experiences were painful and stressful and difficult. Imagine living in Gettysburg or that greater area in 1863 and going into labor with war all around you and death all around you. I cannot even imagine. That's got to be crazy. Particularly knowing that, you know, you might have family on both sides. Right. Or what was even more common is you may be on one side pregnant by someone from the other side. So you are giving birth to a child that could be mothered by a northerner and and, and fathered by a southerner. Crazy times. So I I couldn't even imagine giving birth in that setting. No, I can't. Holy Lord. Considering I literally would have died, there would have been no saving either of us with my first child. So I mean, a lot of these women were giving birth in tents out on basically the grassy fields of Pennsylvania, some harsh stuff. And I can imagine a lot of mothers died. I would imagine there was a lot of babies and young children that died. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. I can't even, it would take a 10 hour podcast just to cover a fraction of the hauntings and the paranormal activity. That place is jam packed. Everyone, yeah. it's, yeah, I can't wait to hear what you've dug up. That place is just like thick with paranormal activity. Have you been to Gettysburg? No. You have not been to Gettysburg? I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. I want to, but I haven't yet. You know what the the scenery is like at Arlington National Cemetery, you know, the little white. I've been there. Fields and fields of those little white matching stones. They have a similar type cemetery in one location in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you're not paying attention, you almost feel like you're at Arlington. I spent a weekend there and I went to this cemetery. Then again, the little white uh, tombstones, very Arlington-esque. And I had happened to be there early in the morning because I was trying to jam pack as much ghosty paranormal sightseeing in that weekend that I could. I mean, why not? Because the place is huge. I mean, we're talking huge. You, it, It's not something, you can't even walk it. You do sometimes have to drive location to location. So it is massive. Monuments everywhere, um, things of that nature. But I'm at this cemetery at probably like eight or nine in the morning and kind of a picture fanatic. I love taking pictures um, not so much of people, but more of places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you take great pictures too. I always love your pictures. You get such a nice perspective, but different podcast. Anyway, keep going. I'm sitting, they they actually still have a lot of like the cannons, basically right where they were left. You'll just be driving down the road and there's a, there'll be a cannon on this. That's kind of gross, actually. 
big murder machines just sitting there. Truly. I mean, cool history, but also kind of gross. From a history perspective, super cool, though. Yeah. So I'm sitting and I'm trying to take pictures in the cemetery of this cannon. And all of a sudden, like it was morning and it was it was kind of the time of year where you have those cool nights, but kind of hotter days. And there was a little bit of a morning fog. I'm taking pictures of these tombstones and this fog is kind of rolling in. All of a sudden, like my eyes were itchy and I have allergies sometimes. So itchy eyes on occasion outside is not out of the norm. So I start rubbing my eyes because, of course, you're not supposed to rub your eyes when they itch. So what's the first thing I do? Rub my eyes when they itch. And I was rubbing my eyes and I stopped rubbing my eyes. And like, have you ever seen someone walk through like smoke or clouds The the clouds kind of like trail behind them as they're walking through it? Yeah, like on a, on I, a misty morning when you walk kind of through that mist and it kind of swirls behind you. Right, right. After I was rubbing my eyes, I went. I looked back at this portion of the cemetery that I was trying to capture pictures of, and it was just like that rolling mist behind people, like a line of people just walking through, but there was nobody there. But nobody there. Oh, wow. Almost in a line that would suggest that it was like a line of soldiers reporting for duty. Military straight. Wow. Yeah. One of the nights I was there, one night I stayed in a hotel. And one night I can't. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry, I had a minor lighter emergency. Go ahead. There is nothing worse than being a weed smoker with a dead lighter, by the way. Knock on wood. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, right? <sighs> anyway, so the one night I camped, they have lots of camping grounds throughout Gettysburg, by the way. I highly recommend it. It's like sleeping with the ghosts, in my opinion. Ooh, that sounds like a that sounds like an adventure. Sleeping with a ghost with shell. Right? That could be a podcast, wouldn't it? Oh my gosh, we're gonna. That's the when we go stay later someplace, this summer. Yeah, later this summer, sleeping with the ghost with Shell and Layla at the witching hour. Dun 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 dun. dun. Um, <laughs> I had been out all day. I'd been sightseeing all day. I'd been looking at things all day, and I was pretty tired. I go back, you know, maybe eleven, twelve o'clock. I'm ready for for bed. I'm ready to be done. It's a lot of walking. It is a lot of walking because it, it's it's miles and miles. But like I said, you know, you you you're in these vast fields. It's not a big city. There's not a lot of technological noise, um, not a lot of road traffic. You know, you're not getting factory noise or highway noise. Very quiet at night. I fall asleep and it, it was almost like as soon as I was in a dead sleep, it's almost like you can hear the goddamn war happening still. What? All of a sudden you'll hear cannons, you'll hear screaming, you'll hear gunfire. What? What? No. It is the craziest thing. Layla, it is the craziest thing. It is like the war is happening. Were you dreaming or or was this? No. You could hear it physically. Were you? I guess what I'm asking is, were you awake? It woke me up. Oh, wow. It woke me up. Wow. Um, it woke me up out of sleep. Creepy. You, you very much get a sense that you are never alone in Gettysburg, day or night. You're never alone. Not that you're being like, I almost want to say, you know, that, you know, you're being watched, but it's not like that. Ooh, I'm being watched. Right. In Gettysburg, it's more like, remember back in the day going to raves? Yes. Oh, yeah. And there was just like a couple hundred people there. Like, you just All your look best at friends. Because, because there were so many people. And Gettysburg is like that. It's like there's so many souls that never left that you can't get away from it so they're like packed in shoulder to shoulder kind of yeah wow that's sad you know, what a what a place just like steeped in sadness you don't necessarily you know need to go into the history of gettysburg you know we've all heard that in in, in high school and elementary and middle school history lessons but i mean fifty thousand people died in that area that's a lot. That is a lot of people over a short span of time. Very yes. And and for all all of you animal lovers and and folks that that agree that animals have souls like humans, 5,000 horses died at Gettysburg. And that is sad. So you got 5,000 horses and circling back to how we started this conversation, I don't know if that includes women 
children, you know, like those unfortunate, uh, you know, the women who, who had to give birth on those battlefields and may or may not have made it. I don't know if those numbers include them. Right. That I'm not sure if that's just soldiers, I guess is what I'm right, saying. Right, right. You know, what's the civilian cost here as well? Right, right. That 50,000 could just be soldiers. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point is a lot of death and none of these people I feel left. And, and if you were to go to Gettysburg, you'd get that same feeling. All 50,000 are still there. Not one of them is left. Traumatic events. That not knowing you're dead. Dying suddenly and in such a traumatic, emo- you know, such traumatic, damaging way. I guess all deaths are damaging, but such a traumatic, horrible way. I mean, there is a place called the Daniel Lady Farm. The Daniel Lady Farm was used uh, for the, by the Confederates as a field hospital. Because, you know, they it, in that atmosphere, they're using people's houses as hospitals. They're using tents as hospitals. So this Daniel Lady Farm, they dealt with a lot of chest wounds and lost limbs. They would try to think of it as like they tried to deal with with the, like, almost like hospice, the Daniel Lady Farm was sometimes where people would go to either recover or suffer through their final moments of life. Yeah. There were 10,000 people that actually are reported to haunt that specific farm. Wow. Like 10,000. That's a big number. Like I can't even go into individual stories. There's that many, you know, there's, there's the cash town in actually that is supposedly the site uh, where the first sur- the first soldier was killed during the Gettysburg campaign. And this cash town inn is actually like eight miles away from like the main battlefield. And the people who currently own it, because it's still there. Is it still an inn? Can you still rent rooms there? You can't rent rooms, but you can go through it. Oh, okay. More like a museum kind of thing. A historical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of the buildings that are still standing are actually museums there. But there, they get a lot of, they feel that that soldier, uh, which they they believe is the first soldier killed during the campaign at Gettysburg, um, they feel he's still there. A lot of lights turning on and off, doors locking and unlocking themselves. But one thing that a lot of visitors throughout the years have noticed is folks will see an apparition of a half blown apart soldier. Oh, wow. And then they claim, oh, no, 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 no. Ghost is bad enough, but a half a ghost? Ew. Blown apart ghost? No, I'm sorry. Let's not do like mangled ghost. That's no. They claim on occasion that there's also (laughs) visible signs of drips of blood where the apparitions had been seen. Ew, 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 ew. No, no, that's gross. Nope, nope, nope. I'm sorry. Drips of blood. How do you? No, no. Mm -mm. The guy never left. The guy never left. What do you know what happened to him? Like, was he blown up in the building or something? What happened? Um, it just all I could find is that the Cash Town Inn was the site of where the first soldier was killed. It oh, doesn't wow. say like where at the inn, if it was outside in the yard or in a room, or if it was by a cannonball or a gun. It just says that that's just the site of where the first soldier was killed. Wow, obviously very violent. Yeah, I wasn't able to find like the exact details of his death. You know, and then there's the Gettysburg Hotel at the Gettysburg Hotel. They got, again, hundreds, hundreds of tales of hauntings. One of a ghost of a woman seen dancing in the ballroom. Paranormal investigators that have been there believe they they have found the spirit of a Union soldier named James Culberston of Company K from the Pennsylvania Reserves and that he's still roaming the halls of the Gettysburg Hotel. You know, interestingly, with the names and stuff of these ghosts, this we should there should still be searchable records of people. Yeah. So they should be able to find if those names are actual people that had served, you would think. I believe they are. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, wow. The, the locations in Gettysburg never end. The Boladary Inn, that was also a uh, used as a, a, a temporary hospital. The ghost train. How fun would this be? You can actually... A ghost train? A ghost train. You can actually take a 90-minute ride on a ghost train. Apparently, it's like the only ghost tour in Gettysburg that takes you across the actual battlefield. But people who have ridden the ghost train claim that they have been able to smell cigar smoke 
and seen soldiers roaming on the train um, with cigars, roaming near the railroad tracks and traveling across the battlefield. Wow. Wow. I want to go on a ghost train. A train ride across the battlefield that has ghosts on the train itself. Dang. And apparently, given the right conditions, you can they they claim they have people who have been on the train have seen ghosts on the battlefield as they were passing the battlefield on the train. Wow. Wow. I know the battlefield is a site of a lot of one of my favorite things, Shell. I absolutely love the orb photos. And I know that a lot of the battlefields oh, they're everywhere are there. Yeah. Everywhere. Gettysburg, that's just a great historical place to go, if nothing else. Even if you're not into the the ghosty paranormally thing, great historical site. It really is. There is actually a monument for every state. And on that monument has a list of names of every soldier that participated in the war. And so like if you were from, say, Massachusetts and you were a part of that war, your name would be on the Massachusetts Monument. They literally have almost every soldier's name monumented there. There's got to be 75 to 100 different type monuments. The battlefields are huge. It, it, it's just it's sad. The only way I can describe it is, is when you're, you're standing on a battlefield and you're just looking across that grass It's a peaceful sadness. Only way I can describe it, a peaceful sadness. Now, are there a lot of reenactments that go on too? Oh, absolutely. I think that they do it every summer. There are public ones, private ones. There are groups that do it. Tourists do it. That's a thing. That's a thing. It probably always will be a thing. Gettysburg is, I would consider, one of the most haunted places on the East Coast personal opinion. Like, don't be blowing up our Instagram or our email, giving me statistics at how wrong I am, but my <laughs> personal <laughs> or do, <laughs> right. I, 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 my personal opinion is, is that the Gettysburg um, battlefield in the Gettysburg area is one of the most haunted places on the East coast, just for the sole fact of sheer numbers. Did you see any ghosts while you were there? Multiple. Like I had said, in, in the cemetery, seeing those, those misty body movements <laughs> through the field, I hear things. I heard cannons, you know, I heard gunfire, I heard shouting, I heard screaming. But probably my, my only actual visualization experiences were in the actual cemetery. I heard stuff on the battleground, but I didn't see stuff on the battleground. But, you know, everybody, everybody kind of senses things sometimes differently, audio, visual, you know, but as far as visually, it, it was, it was that cemetery for sure. Audibly everywhere, everywhere. You just hear faint horror. It's horrible. Oof. It does sound awful just to hear that type of suffering. Mm. I, you know, obviously born in the decade I was born in, I haven't heard a live cannon shot, for (laughs) Christ's sakes, but I was hearing that clear as day, clear as day, just sad. There's just so much sadness you feel there. Just kind of permeates everything. It does. It's hard to be like joyous and happy on a trip to Gettysburg. Like just the whole vibe is oppressive. And kind of the vibe is sad and oppressive. Yeah, no, I'm not down in Gettysburg. I, I love Gettysburg. Great place. But it is not a joyous place. Yeah. yeah so th- I don't think the sight of that much death ever, ever really could be. It's just overwhelming, peaceful sadness. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to describe it. So everybody go to Gettysburg, hop on a train, hop on a plane, get in your car, go see the ghost because there is like 50,000 plus there. You're not going to miss out. You know, it, it, it was hard. And I, I do want to point this out. It was kind of hard to pinpoint specific stories um, and specific incidences just out of sheer volume. You could talk to a hundred people and get a hundred different stories. That's why, you know, I wanted to mention some of the things I saw and heard, especially in the cemetery, because it's hard to give a detailed narrative of experiences at Gettysburg because there's just everywhere you turn. You know, I, I kind of didn't feel alone when I was using a porta potty on a battlefield there one day. Like, <laughs> well, that's not cool. You don't want to have to share a bathroom with a ghost. You know, they, there should be some places that are like sacrosanct. And, and I think bathrooms yeah, right? ghosts should just stay out of bathrooms. 
But the point is like, you can't escape it there. It's everywhere. Every building has a story. Every road has a story. Every field has a story. It's all encompassing. It's just, it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, we could do six full one hour episodes just on specific stories of Gettysburg. It, it's that much. Wow. But the feeling you get looking at these cannons out into these fields, you know, you look at this cannon knowing that five minutes ago you faintly heard it in the corner of your ear. Right. Also right. knowing also knowing it hasn't been fired in 130 years. Wow. The feeling you get is just one of being transported back into time. You know, when you when you hear those screams when you're standing next to that cannon, you are standing next to that cannon that you know damn well caused those screams that you're faintly hearing that are 130 years old. That's an eerie feeling. That's got to be like really creepy. It's an unsettling vibe. It's an unsettling vibe. It definitely sounds like it. I mean, it's not scared. Like, it's not like you're going to go to an asylum and get freaked out or... Well, you said like it's peaceful. It is very peaceful. But especially if you're an empathetic person, it's it's almost kind of heartbreaking to be there because of the overwhelming sadness and, and confusion. Because honest to God, you know, like that soldier that I was saying that was the first one killed, I don't think he knows he's dead. And that's sad. Even though he's the one that's like in pieces and his blood is on the walls, he hasn't figured it out yet. <laughs> they were awfully young. You know, those soldiers were very young. We'll give them that. Well, also remember, you know, some of these some of these folks um, went into this war at 15, 16. Yeah. Some you of know, them it's, not like, it's not like young. modern day. Yeah. It's not like modern day where there's a, you know, a legal age limit. You know, if you could hold and point a gun, off you go. And yeah, they were that. pretty much recruiting everybody. Yeah. Sad stories, Shell. Super sad. Jeez, I think we need to smoke after. That was that was like a, a you know, and, and the thing is, it just made me sad talking about it. But I guess, like you know, but but Gettysburg is definitely one of those places that I think people should try to try to get at at some point because it is rich in history and paranormal activity. All right. Cool story. Sad story, Shell. Yeah, I, you know, I guess maybe maybe people don't realize how sad Gettysburg actually is. Yeah, yeah, pretty sad. Go there, be sad, take orb photos and send them to me. <laughs> orb photos make me happy. Maybe that would uh, counteract the sad. Yeah, right. <laughs> we have to go look up some orb photos after this just to get happy again or snack on some chocolate. What are you snacking on today, Shell? You know, actually, I have veered away. I have veered away from my usual snack, and I am actually eating a <laughs> buffalo chicken calzone. Oh wow! I want a buffalo <laughs> chicken calzone. Oh, yeah, I'm eating cereal straight out of a box. That's not cool. <laughs> wow, that takes me back a little bit. Cereal <laughs> right out the box. It's like the stoner snack of choice, right? Super easy. Well, in my defense on stoner food, um, that I actually had had this for dinner last night. So it is, think of it as, is leftover cold pizza. Mm, even better. Right? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, on that note, since I don't have any calzone, all I have is stupid dry cereal. I'm going to smoke a little more pot and then I'll tell my story. Well, maybe if you're lucky, the aliens will bring you some snacks. I've never heard any stuff. I saw so many stories, Shell, but they're none about aliens bringing anyone snacks. <sighs> ah, bastards. Right? They should, though. But they should. I don't know if there's like a request box or something. Dear aliens, please bring snacks before you anal probe me. Before you dive into your story, I do want to point out, I knew you were doing this this week and I was mm -hmm. getting super excited the last few days thinking about, oh, we're going to talk about alien. I love aliens. So jealous you get to do aliens, by the way. <laughs> and so I read the news generally every day, more online, not a paper type person. There's been a lot of alien reportings this week. This particular week, there has been, there was a, a, a bunch of, what were they calling them? Tic-tac-shaped UFOs 
chasing Navy ships this week. They knew I was going to talk about them. So they've been coming out in droves. I don't know if it was thinking about what you were going to talk about combined with these news stories this week, but like, bring it on because I want to get invaded, man. (laughs) We're actually going to kind of break this up into two segments because when you start talking about aliens, there is so much stuff, so much. Oh my gosh. It's crazy. Just the sheer, again, like you were saying with Gettysburg, just the sheer volume of stories that people have, abduction stories, sightings, and even the U.S. government has just recently, what was it, in uh, 2020, that they were like, oh yeah, by the way, here's all these videos of things that we can't explain. This particular podcast cast, we're going to focus on mostly on Area 51 and the Roswell incident. We're going to kind of stick to that. And then we'll do a separate podcast on like aliens and sightings and abductions and things. Because again, the sheer volume is so much. But that secrecy and that lying is what caused a lot of the problems here and what continues to cause controversy, even though they've supposedly fessed up and kind of brought all this information forward now, people still don't believe them because they keep doing well, here's the real truth. Oh, no, wait, that wasn't the truth. That was a lie to cover up this real truth. And then they keep doing that and going back and forth. All that does is garner more interest. If exactly. they would have just fess, if they would have fessed up 50 years ago and said, yeah, there's aliens here, whatever. No one would be breaking in to Area 51 currently. They'd be like, yeah, there's aliens there. What? We knew that. Exactly. Exactly. And I've heard it referred to as Hysteria 51. And I think there's even like a a few videos or something called that. And I love that phrase because it suits it perfectly. Again, everything's full of holes, recanted, stories are changed. And this is just government officials. I'm not talking about like civilian witnesses. This is just like government people constantly changing their stories. So it, it's enough to make anybody hysterical because of just everything that's crazy. Do you remember the, um, in 2019, when it went viral, Area 51 went viral again because of, what was it? They can't stop all of us. Show me them aliens. <laughs> yes, yes. Which again, if they would just fess up to it and tell the truth, stuff like that wouldn't happen because you'd have not... There would be no people asking you to fess up because we would know. Exactly. But like millions of people responded to that, although they they didn't end up going. But that just shows that the interest and the idea that there's still a conspiracy is still there, even though they have now confessed to what was actually going on there, which was this. That's New Mexico, correct? The U.S. Air Force, it's Area 51 is a U.S. Air Force military base. It's located in Groom Lake in southern Nevada. So it's about 70 or so miles from Las Vegas. It's officially classified as Homey Air Homey Airport and it's property of the US Air Force. And it's it's some it's surrounded by mountains in the middle of the Nevada desert. I didn't realize it was that close to Vegas. Yeah, like 70, 80 miles roughly. So people are forbidden to walk anywhere near it. They have trust no trespassing signs and the, the signs say that you will be shot on site. Deadly force is authorized if you go there. Has anybody been shot on site? You know what? I did not look into that, but probably. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I haven't looked into that. There was just so much alien stuff. I didn't go there. You know, knowing that it was there is part of what fueled a lot of these conspiracy theories because people knew that stuff was going on there, that secret tests of some sort were happening there. But the government kept saying, nope, nothing to see here. You know, do not look at the man behind the curtain. So Annie makes us want to look even more. Exactly. It makes people highly suspicious. So uh, Annie Jacobson wrote a book called Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. And she basically says that Area 51 was the birthplace of a lot of spy planes. You know, the CIA did a lot of work there. They um, it's where the U-2 spy plane was first built back in the 50s. Yeah. And the intelligence community has a lot of things going on there. So there was a lot of reason to keep it secret. They were testing these weather balloons uh, that weren't really weather balloons. They were to detect radiation. You know, this was back when the Cold War was happening and and nuclear weapons were starting to proliferate all over. So they had developed these balloons that could go really high and detect when um, nuclear weapons had been set off, but they didn't want to tell anyone about it. And these, so the, the airplanes, the U-2 airplane, was developed. And of course we had to keep this secret and this plane could fly way higher, 40,000 feet higher than any known plane at the time. And they could fly extremely fast. And so in 1955, when airplanes were not thought to go even remotely that high or that fast, 
sometimes pilots would catch sight of this big round fuel. These U-2 planes had like a a fuel tank that was really big and round that hung underneath the plane. So it's flying 40,000 feet higher than any known plane at the time. And no one's talking about these things going super fast. A pilot or someone on the ground sees light shining off this big, round, shiny thing in the sky. What are they going to think? So that explained a lot of it. And the other plane that they tested there was, (laughs) this was fun. It was called the A-12 reconnaissance plane. And interestingly, that plane has been recently in the news because of Elon Musk. What? Yeah. Elon Musk and Grimes, the singer, the artist Grimes, they had a baby, right? You've heard this? Right. Right. Do you remember? The baby with the name. I don't know what the name is, letters and weird stuff. Yes, exactly. The name is X Ash Archangel 12, which it looks like the letter X and then the letters A and E stuck together. And then the letter A and then XII for 12 because they couldn't use numbers. But they said the letter X, they said, stands for the unknown variable. A-E, she says, Grimes says, is the elven spelling of A-I, which is like intelligence or A-I, and it's pronounced Ash. And then Archangel 12, the A-12, was Elon Musk's contribution. And he said that it was because it was his and Grimes' favorite aircraft. It had no weapons, no defenses, just speed, great in battle, but nonviolent. So um, the A-12 or the Archangel 12 was one of the secret spy planes that was tested at Area 51 back in, in the 50s. This one could travel like 2,200 miles an hour at 90,000 feet. It was this amazingly fast secret spy plane that no one knew about. But of course, if you're flying it over the U.S., people are going to see it or they're going to see flashes of it. And so they're saying that, that these secret planes and the secret balloons were really what caused the alien sightings in Area 51. However, that stuff wasn't being tested until the 50s. And it was in the 40s when UFO sightings really started to happen in the area. Um, There were reports of lights in the sky, strange objects in the sky. And and those were just rampant in the 40s. And if we didn't start testing these planes and shit until the 50s, you know, something else was going on at the time. So it was in the late 40s. It was... um, July 8th, 1947, a press release came out of Roswell, New Mexico. This is where we get into the Roswell incident, which goes back to Area 51. The newspaper said that a UFO had been found. This was on all the papers. A flying saucer had been found and it was now in the Army's possession. The very next day, a retraction was printed saying, nope, wasn't an Army, was not a flying saucer. Nothing to see here again. It was just a weather balloon. Now, things get a little weird because this so-called weather balloon um, was reported by a a man named William Brazel, and he has a farm in Roswell, and he noticed the sheep were avoiding an area of the farm. So he went over there and he discovered debris scattered over like half a mile, metallic debris, some of it that looked like some type of aluminum foil, some that looked like paper and sticks, but you know, this weird metal that he had never seen before that was flexible, thin, like aluminum foil. It had some type of writing on it, but it wasn't recognizable. So he immediately called the authorities and the Air Force came out from the nearby Roswell Army Airfield. And they're the ones that issued the press release saying that it was a flying saucer, a UFO that had crashed. So Roswell and Area 51 are actually two separate locations. Two correct? separate locations. That's right. Area 51 gets in uh, in Nevada, gets involved in the in the Roswell incident of Roswell, New Mexico, but they're not the same place. Two different places, two different events. Okay. Maybe that's where I got confused and thought that Area 51 was in New Mexico because I, for some reason, I thought they were the same place. The Roswell incident kind of predates uh, what we know of, of alien sightings in um at Area 51, but the everything that was taken out of the Roswell incident was taken to Area 51, and that's okay, where. Okay. <laughs> if you want to get into the conspiracy theories, um, all right. Well, let's cover the Roswell incident first, and then I'll tell you how they're connected. Interestingly, the news that news report that went out that said a spacecraft had been found was issued by First Lieutenant Walter Hout. I think that's how you say his name. And he was a public information officer at the Air Force Base. So he issued this press release. And then he later had to issue the retraction saying, oh, it was really a weather balloon. And this made him, by all accounts, a a figure of ridicule. So he kind of kept a low profile for decades. And in the 70s, all he would say about it to his daughter was, I put out the press release. And that's all he would say. 
He would never talk about it. However, he did leave a sealed document to only be opened after his death. And he passed away in 2005. And in this sealed document, he revealed that not only was his initial press release the true one saying that a flying saucer had crashed, but that there had actually been two crash sites at Roswell. And he himself had seen the spacecraft and the alien bodies that had been there. So he wouldn't talk about it while he was alive. All he would say was, I issued the press release. Yeah, but I think that... I think that some of the people like him and the local law enforcement and and some locals, I think they were they were extremely threatened by the U.S. government to keep their damn mouth shut. That is why that is why he would only say I issued a press release because, you know, some of these people, they were they were threatened personally. Their, Their family and loved ones were threatened. And it was literally life or death that they kept their mouth shut. You are exactly right. This is just one of a pattern of people who, while they were alive, wouldn't talk or for a while wouldn't talk and then later changed their story. They all had a pattern of abuse. And maybe he didn't because he waited until, you know, he just left this sealed statement until after he passed away. That's not the first person who has either said something on their deathbed or left a letter at death about this incident. He is not the first one. Exactly. There's multiple accounts. And so things that seem to be explained away suddenly by this deathbed recantation come back to aliens all over again. And there's some people that say that these crashes, these two um, Roswell, New Mexico crashes were taken to Area 51. And that's how they developed the A-12 and the U-2 planes and all these spy balloons. Didn't they say that they actually retrieve live aliens from Roswell that had not died in the crash? Most of the reports that I found talked about deceased aliens, including like a mortician, Glenn Dennis. Glenn Dennis in 1947 was a mortician and his funeral home had a contract with the airfield, the Roswell Army Airfield Base, uh, to hold funeral services. And in 1989, he claimed that back in 47, a friend of his who was a nurse at the Roswell Airfield had accidentally walked into an examination room where doctors were bent over the bodies of those three creatures that they had recovered from Roswell. And that nurse said that the bodies resembled humans and but were very small with spindly arms and giant heads. The mortician Glenn Dennis also says that he had gotten a series of phone calls that night in 47 asking him what the best way to handle small bodies was, how best to preserve bodies that had been exposed to the elements and other questions of that nature. But he did not reveal any of that information until, you know, the late eighties people were like you said, they were keeping quiet. Everything was, you know, they were trying to keep it as secret as possible or it was all bullshit. <laughs> you got to figure though, a whole town was overtaken by the military for days for while days. they recovered for for while they recovered all of whatever it is they were recovering and how crazy is the US government that they were able to successfully silence a whole town worth of people that just blows my damn mind well that's the thing is is like that's why you know there's so many stories that come out and then are immediately squashed things like um in the early 60s the son of the rancher where the debris had been found he was like wasted drunk in a bar and he's bragging about how he had kept a piece of metal from the crash the very next day cia agents raided his house saying that he had government property and needed to turn it over immediately yeah if that was a weather balloon like Come on, that much fuss over having a piece of a weather balloon, you know, 15 years later. And the crash itself, there's varying reports. The government officially says that it was just a small amount. You know, they gathered it up and it was just enough for like a small bundle weighing like less than five pounds. However, the, the debris that was taken away was taken away in multiple trucks and one of those large planes, the same plane that was used to drop like the A-bomb. So why that much transportation? Why that many trucks? Why, why that big of a plane for a small bundle weighing less than five pounds? The other um, witness statements about the crash site say that it was over an extensive area, like, like half a mile of worth of debris. And it was all these twisted pieces of metal and these weird aluminum foil shapes and things. So, so which what's, what's true here. It's, it's kind of hard to sort through that. And then you have someone else, 
a scientist who you may or may not have seen. I know Joe Rogan's been in the news lately. And this gentleman, Bob Lazar, when I was looking him up, the, the Joe Rogan interview kept getting pushed into my face over and over and over again. So if you want to see it, I guess you can go check that out on YouTube or whatever. But Bob Lazar is a scientist who in the late 80s claimed that he had worked at Area 51 specifically on alien spacecraft, on craft that had come from this Roswell, New Mexico crash. This Bob Lazar guy is quite a character. He says he got hired because he had put a rocket engine on his car. So he had an old Honda that he put a jet engine on. You know, but that makes that makes sense that they're looking for that one weirdo who is like super engineering and scientific savvy. Exactly. So in a roundabout way, that car kind of helped him get a job at this test site in Nevada. He did not know that it was called Area 51. That's not what it was called at the time. And he didn't know what he was going to be working on. He says that he thought he was going to be working on uh, experimental aircraft, like experimental spy planes. And I guess technically he kind of was. He was. Right. (laughs) He says when he first saw the UFO, when he walked by, it was in a, a hangar and there was a lot of military around, more guards than he was used to seeing. And it had a, ironically, it had like a USA flag on it. He thought it was just a, of course we would tag it. Right. Like we're, we're like, it's like America's dogs that got to pee on their possessions. They have to pee on everything. Yeah. So he thought it was like a, a prototype of some Amer- new American spy plane, not a UFO. So he worked with this guy named supposedly Barry and his job was to reverse engineer the, the fuel source that, that powered the system. And he says, he says that there were nine different craft and he was only allowed limited information on the other ones besides the one that he was working on. He says that after he came forward, just like you said, he was attacked. His wife was attacked. They shot his tires out. You know, they harassed him into leaving other jobs. And he says it was over this fuel source that he had been trying to reverse engineer that he called element 115. Now, at the time that he came out in 1989, there was no element 115. It didn't exist. And in 2003, They did add element 115 to the periodic table. It's an element called Muscovium. And it doesn't really resemble what Lazar said he was working on, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It doesn't negate it either. Correct. Now, Lazar has kind of hinted for a while that he had some of this element 115. And he says that it's this element is highly radioactive. And the stable version of it is what allows alien space spacecraft to kind of like traverse the universe. Basically, he says by it helps them to bend gravity. So, you know, kind of make places closer to each other by bending the gravity. So he says that he's got some of this. In 2018, he was doing a documentary with a filmmaker. Get this name. I love this. So this filmmaker is, and you may have heard of it because you just mentioned a video that I think he took, Jeremy Kenyon Locklear Corbell. He was filming a documentary called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. And you can, you can watch the documentary. But during the filming at Bob Lazar's current place of business, which is a business of his called United Nuclear Scientific, the FBI raided that business the day after an interview was held there for this documentary. And during that part of the documentary, Bob Lazar had said, I have some of this element 115. But that had just been amongst them, the film crew and Bob Lazar in his business while he was recording. And the very next day he was raided. They got that guy bugged. They're bugging him. That's what I'm saying, right? The FBI says, no, of course not. Had nothing to do with, with element 115, nothing to do whatsoever. They said it had to do with a murder investigation. So apparently, let me tell you, I am a I am a witch and I do not believe in coincidences here. Right, right. So they're saying that United Nuclear Scientific, one of the things they do is that they they sell rare elements. And I guess there's people that collect all the elements of the periodic table. That's an odd habit. Right? Isn't that weird? So supposedly someone had passed away, a collector of these elements, and their collection had gone to Lazar's business to be sold. Thallium, I guess. Thallium is one of the elements that's on there and it's very hard to get. And so this collection had thallium in it and the collection was purchased by someone. And then a 31 year old woman was found dead of thallium poisoning. And somehow she was connected to the person who had bought the collection that had thallium in it. I don't know. So they had sold the collection that had thallium in it. And that thallium was later used to kill a 31 year old woman. And so they're saying that that weird coincidence 
the day after Lazar says that he has element 115 in his possession, he is raided. And of course they said it had nothing to do. It was just a coincidence. Did he actually have it? Did they take it? He says he does. He says he does. He, he says they don't have it. He says he still has it. You know, he's been on numerous documentaries. Again, he's been on that, you know, if, if you're into Joe Rogan, he's been on that Joe Rogan podcast. He's been all over the place. And the, the video that you talked about, the tic-tac lights going around the, the Navy ships, I believe that the, the gentleman who did the documentary also was the person who filmed those, uh, that video. Oh. The, the government says, yeah, we don't know what they are. It's uh, UAPs. They don't say UFOs anymore. More. They like to say unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP. So I don't know why. Yeah. But okay. They're like, okay, it doesn't necessarily, it could be, could be tech from other countries that we don't know about. Um, we just don't know what it is. You know, they're not saying, they're like, we're not saying it's aliens, but we're not not saying it's aliens either. So they don't want to, after all these years, uh, admit right. that there's a well, they have all these different secretive things. Like they did this um, thing called Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book was created to study UFO reports. It was like the super secret thing. When Project Blue Book ended, it had collected over 12,000 UFO reports. And it had concluded most of them were like clouds or stars or aircraft, or, you know, natural things. However, 701 reports, even after stringent, complete, total analysis were determined to be unexplained. So, you know, they, a lot of those reports, again, were, were explained by like the secret planes that were flying around, weather phenomena, but 701 reports are completely unable to be explained by the government. Wow. Pretty wild, wow. right? That's a lot. That is a lot. Did we find a real spacecraft at Roswell? And is that what we studied in order to get the tech that allowed some of these planes, you know, who knows, did they study aliens? There's, there's a lot of stuff that says they might've, there's a lot of stuff that says that they probably didn't. And that's not even getting into all the other conspiracy theories, like the majestic 12 group that was supposedly brought together to research aliens and to find aliens. You know, there's just so much, it, it's just crazy. There's so much shell. Wow. Wow. So, you know, this is also sadly a good lesson, you know, kids, this is, this is a good example of how to not trust your government by their own <laughs> hand. They made it this way, you know, don't lie to me and then be mad when I call you a liar kind of thing. You, you know what I mean? It, yeah. Yeah. On the one hand, I can understand that, you know, it, it does seem pretty logical. Okay. Area 51 is a secret air force base because they're testing you know, spy equipment, they're testing, you know, things to help keep us safe, you know, help detect nuclear detonations and stuff like that. And you have to keep that secret. You can't just be like, oh yeah, okay. You saw it. You saw the, you know, the, the fuselage or whatever and fuel tank, you saw the fuel tank. And now we're going to tell you all about the spy planes that we're working on to help stop the cold war. You know, I, I guess I can understand that they're not going to tell us about all of that, but, but the constant back and forths and the, the witnesses who say one thing and, recant only to go back to the first story again. It just very ripe ground for conspiracy theories. Now, if I had been the president, I would have been like, you know what? You're absolutely right. Aliens, shit's about to get real. And then I would have moved all of the secret stuff that we really don't need to know about to a whole different part of the country. And I would have fessed up to the damn alien shit. <laughs> you know, you'd think they could at this point, but you know, the fact that they're declassifying some of this, uh, video information and saying we actually do have over 700 unidentified objects that are flying around in our in our airspace and we don't know what they are we don't know if it's some other some other country that's doing it we don't know we don't know and to circle back to the beginning of the conversation you know i've seen at least two articles this week this week i understand we've got some stuff going on here but we need to I don't know. I don't want to be a doomsdayer, but you know, we need to prepare for an invasion, man. You don't know. So true. And everybody's got, know. everybody knows somebody. If you yourself don't have some sort of unidentified flying object or alien, alien abduction or alien sighting story, then you know, someone who has one. I mean, I have the weirdest story when I was a kid, I'm not going to get into the details, but I was pretty sure I saw a spaceship right outside my window and maybe it was sleep paralysis. I don't know, but 
couldn't move, you know, the whole, see the bright light, the whole thing. And I would have dismissed it as a dream, except my brother had the exact same thing happen and saw the exact same thing out his window that night. So I don't know what happened, but could have been aliens, could have been sleep paralysis. I don't know. This was at a point in our lives where you and I had not met yet. And we were, we were younger, smaller children, and we did not grow up in the same town. Right. I also had an experience in ninth grade and not only did I see it, but it ended up being seen by the majority of the residents in my county and actually had made it on the news. So it wasn't just like, you know, a ninth grade shell out there being weird. Most of, of not just the, the town um, and surrounding city, but the whole county had, had, had seen these multiple objects in the sky. You know, that's the curious thing here is that a lot of times something has happened that you can corroborate. Multiple people see this or, right. you know, there's some weird video that you can't account for. Or the other one that I really love is missing time. When people have yeah. missing time episodes, some of those are truly freaky. And and that was always that was always my thing with, with Roswell and Area 51. There's just too many people who have sightings and stories and experiences from not only the Roswell incident, but Area 51, that at this point, there's too many stories for me to believe you that it's fake. Yeah, it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And and I remember one of the things that struck me back in in the 80s when this first came out, I remember hearing about this guy who had worked at Area 51 and says he worked on aliens. And I remember the investigative reporter had said that they checked, they checked this guy's story. And of course the government said, nope, Bob Lazar never worked for us. And they, they checked records and they had done some sort of um, FOIA uh, request and gotten a bunch of paperwork. And of course, time cards, nope, no time cards with Bob Lazar's name. However, there was a whole bunch of other paperwork inter-office memos that had his name on it and uh, listings of, you know, we'd like to thank everyone in the office and his name would be in there and, and different paperwork like that. And that struck me as interesting. They had scrubbed his name from all the official paperwork, but they hadn't been able to go through to all the other hundreds of papers that had his name listed there. And, and back in 1989, that, that was one of the inconsistencies that hit me you know, they're obviously lying. It was this investigative reporter found the lie. What else are they lying about? And it, that's the theme that just kind of carried through with all the witnesses. Now, let me ask you this. What has become of the Roswell site? Year 2022, I'm driving to New Mexico. What am I finding when I go to the Roswell site? Well, you can go out there. I know that area 51, there's the town of Rachel that you can go out to and they have, there's an inn, there's a whole bunch of stuff around a little bit of alien tourism, which a lot of the people in 2019, when they went out found, but the Roswell site, New Mexico. But I mean, where, where the crash was, was that, was that like a, like a, a personal property where that was, or was that like in a, I don't know, a state land type thing? I guess I really didn't know much about the, the actual site itself. The site itself was a private ranch. There was a, a rancher that owned it, um, Mac Brazel. Um, I think it might've been his ranch. So it was a private ranch, uh, William, W.W. Mac Brazel, William Brazel. I guess at the time, because of all the sightings in the 40s of all these lights and, and flying objects, there was a, a talk about a reward. And that's one of the reasons why they were so quick to report what they had found. It operated as a ranch for the longest time, but now you can go on tours. It looks like. Ah, okay. Okay. In 2018. So I guess it was a ranch up until 2018. <laughs> and then in oh, 2018. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It says uh, Lauren Bogle, whose family owns the ranch. So the Bogles have owned it. Bogle family has owned it since 1952 when it was sold by the Brazel family. Uh, she says that a lot of the pens that they still had is very original. They haven't changed a lot. A lot of the ranch is still the same as it was back in the 40s. And again, it operated as a ranch. It looks like right up until 2018. So it's just a cow operation until now they're doing uh, a Roswell experience. You can go do a tour and see where the UFO was and and all of that. So tickets are pretty pricey between 65 and $250. You can go on a VIP Roswell crash site tour. Damn. 
talk about cashing in on tourism. Why not? I mean, why not take people that there's still, again, so much interest, even though we know all about these spy planes, even though we know a lot of the secrecy was due to, you know, these spy things. Why were people seeing stuff in the 40s before these planes were even developed? Was there an alien crash site? Is that how we developed the planes? You know, that's, I don't know. Yeah, it's the conspiracy theory in me is uh, questioning. Because they, again, they flip-flopped so much, so many stories of personal- You don't know what to believe. You don't know what to believe anymore. And and maybe that was part of the point. (laughs) You know, just kind of expose some of it to keep the rest of it secret. Who knows? Not to mention, there's probably still a bunch of stuff about it that no one knows about even. Right. And I'm sure if if there were aliens and ships there, I'm sure they have moved it all by now. And maybe they kind of uh, pump up the controversy to keep our attention focused on Area 51 when all this other stuff has been moved elsewhere. Because you're talking what? Pushing 75 years ago. Right. And they're only just recently declassifying some of it. Right. Right. I would imagine... You know, probably all that alien craft stuff has been moved to a tiny little village in upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably what they did with the um, the Seneca Army Depot. That's probably what they did with, yeah. with the Seneca Army Depot is they moved all the aliens there and they're just pretending yep, that yep. it's a it's a closed white deer sanctuary. It's really where they've got all the aliens. Don't tell anyone. I would totally I would totally believe that. Absolutely. Yeah. Seneca Army Depot in upstate New York is not where they are keeping aliens and UFOs. Not. No, it is not. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to episode eight. We now have people on four different countries. <laughs> New Zealand. New Zealand has come in. So we have people from countries all over the world. I cannot believe it. Thank you all so much for listening. You know, please like, subscribe, leave us a review if the the app that you're using allows that. We appreciate you so much. You can find us on YouTube now. Uh, we're on Instagram. Stone and this. All right, Shell, you give us the socials. <laughs> <laughs> you can find us on Instagram at the Stoned Witches Hour or on Twitter at the Stoned Witches. You can get us on email at the Stoned Witches at gmail.com or you can use red semi four flags and smoke signals. Make sure it's marijuana smoke signals and please marijuana smoke signals. <laughs> listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. And now you can listen to us on YouTube as well. So thank you all again. And we'll see you next week. Happy 420. Oh, what are you talking about next week, Shell? Oh, wait, next week. Wow. I forgot all about even mentioning next week. I am actually going to, this is going to be an interesting one. Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Ooh. This is a popular one. You do love your asylums. Are you trying to tell us something, Shell? Um, but this popular one, this one is one that a lot of ghost hunters and a lot of paranormal groups um, go to. So Trans-Allegheny, we're going to give our spin on it and, and take you to another asylum. Oh, that sounds so creepy. They always creep me right out. The stories out of the asylums it seem to be some of the spookiest ones. I'm so looking forward to that. Where are you taking us? Where are you taking us next week? I'm going to go, actually, to yet another place that has been termed a gateway to hell. You know, kind of keeping with a the theme. I love them. Love them. There seem to be so many in the U.S. But this one is called Crater Lake, and it is an absolutely gorgeous lake in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. And it has Ooh. a really spooky, creepy history. So we're going to go there and we're going to learn all about a place that the indigenous people, the Claymath people, consider sacred and think is a site too sacred for human eyes. So, yeah. So next episode, we're going to go sacred and crazy. Sacred and crazy. All right. We'll see you then. Stay stony. I don't know. We did that before. Let's not do that one again. (laughs) All right. Cool. Yay.